Hello, everyone out in Illumination. Uh, we're so excited to have you come join us today. Um, we've got a really great webinar coming from a, a gentleman named ben, uh, Benjamin Fernandez. And in this webinar, he is going to go over addressing student needs, uh, planning for the transition back uh, to the brick and mortar school. Uh, again, I think that's top of mind for a lot of people. Um, you know, what is the new normal going to look like? Um, so yeah, if we could go to the next slide, I'd love to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what the schedule is for today. Um, our agenda is follows. It looks like we don't have it completely correct here, but we've, we're just gonna introduce and do a couple of housekeeping items and then jump into this presentation. I think the presentation is probably gonna be closer to 40 or 45 minutes, Ben. Yes. Yep. Um, and so we, We'll be going there. And then at the end, we've got a Q&A. So I want to remind everyone um, that we have a chat. So in the chat function, please, as you have questions, write them in, in, in the chat. And then at the end of this presentation, we'll go back and revisit those. Um, we'll go back and revisit all of the questions or try to get through as many as we can. Um, also, I'm going to be dropping uh, a handout link to this if you'd like to have the handout and follow along with it. I'm dropping it in right now. Um, and so we'll be doing that. Um, and then also uh, last but not least, um, we need to jump into our introduction. We need to, you, I want you guys to learn who this, this fine gentleman is and, and why you should be listening to him. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, and of course, I need to introduce who we are. Some of you are familiar with who we are. We are Aluma Online Therapy. Some of you, this might be your first interaction with us. Um, we provide mental health and related services online. We've been around for 10 years and are consistently growing as we see uh, the demand in, in special education and in K-12 grow in these areas. Um, could you go to the next slide? Um, the webinar, this is part of our illuminated webinar series. We have a whole series of webinars we do every month. Um, and, and for all of you as well, um, we're going to be recording this webinar and, and sending out the associated materials, the deck, the handout to everyone who registered. Um, and obviously if you would like a certificate of attendance, we can provide that as well. Just let us know. Um, next slide. Our presenter, Benjamin Fernandez. Um, ben serves as lead school psychologist in Northern Virginia and is a member of the National Association of School Psychologists School Safety and Crisis, Crisis Response Committee. He provides leadership and an array of psychological and school-based mental health services. He's a crisis leader, a prepare, a prepare master trainer, and coordinates crisis intervention services for his district. For NASP, he has conducted presentations and contribu contributed on topics related to youth suicide, prepare, and school safety in crisis. Benjamin was honored by being named School Psychologist of the Year by the Virginia Academy of School Psychologists and NASP as well. Um, without any further ado, let's turn it over to Benjamin Fernandez. Thanks, George. I appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you everyone <clears throat> uh, for, you know, taking the time out today to, to spend some time with me as we talk about um, supporting uh, student needs as we're coming back to the brick and mortar. Um, you know, it's, it, it's something I think about a lot and I know we've all been impacted by the pandemic. And I, I think it, we're, we're all recognizing that we're not gonna start the next school year like we started you know, school school years in the past, we're going to have some unique challenges as we um, as we as we move forward. And so, I'd like to talk a little bit about that, and hopefully give you some ideas um, on, on what to do. So, here's my contact information. If you want to reach out uh, after the the webinar with any questions or, or, or anything like that, so feel free to reach out. Um, but I, I want to start off by just kind of reviewing our, our, our year, our, our year and a half uh, in, in COVID. Um, you know, I know we all went through it, but this will kind of set the foundation to help us understand why we're going in the direction that we're going. Um, so when COVID happened, 
it, it, it started for me on March 12th when I found out my school district was closing. Um, and then school districts around the, the country and the world started closing. And we started seeing um, a lot of different impacts with, uh, with the closures, you know, from you know, travel restrictions, businesses closing, people getting sick, all those things. But with schools, we saw all sorts of things happening. We saw some schools close. We saw some schools go all virtual. We saw some schools stay open. And we, and we saw some schools kind of have this hybrid in-person asynchronous model. And that seemed to be changing, um, you know, week by week, day by day, as, as the pa pandemic went on. Uh, when it first started uh, in the spring of uh, 2020. So there's been a lot of impact to all the learners out there. And to, and to provide a little context to that, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the COVID-19 landscape as, as it relates to education. So looking at the screen, I, I was able to dig up some numbers um, uh, about you know, what happened to, to our students. And looking back in April, 2020, 1.2 billion students globally were out of school. That, that's when things started happening. That's when schools started closing. So globally, there's a over 1.2 billion kids weren't being educated because of this pandemic. Then flash forward to June 30th, 2021, we're looking at approximately um, over 156 million uh, students who, who are being impacted or learners being impacted by this pandemic still. Focusing more on the United States, um, you know, which uh, looking at kind of the data I was looking at, they, 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 were, they categorized different countries in, in different ways and the United States was considered uh, partially open and about uh, over um, 58 million students were, were impacted preschool through 12. Um, you know, when you add in college students, that, that number dramatically increases as well. But one of the things that was interesting, and I'd imagine it's not necessarily unique, uh, a unique issue for the United States, but I believe in other countries as well, is that um, one of the, the data was pretty clear that during this pandemic, um, st uh, impoverished students, students in, in lower income, uh, who, who were lower income students were, were less likely to be benefiting from you know, the online uh, instruction compared to their more uh, resource heavy or re re uh, wealthier counterparts. So that is something very interesting to, to keep in mind as we move forward, because whatever we do to support our students, we need to make sure we're thinking about all our students. Um, and sometimes it's the, we, we forget about that. So let's kind of keep that in, on, on the forefront uh, of our minds as we move forward. So not only were, you know, we, we just talked about the impact of broadly to, 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 to learners and to students, but when we drill down to our own districts and we drill down to our own schools, um, you know, it, we were pretty, pretty clear on the, or, you know, pretty aware of the impact to our families and students. You know, in my district, we saw a number of different things. And I'd imagine you, you all have seen that as well, that, you know, we, we saw, families um, losing losing their losing their jobs you know fathers and mothers losing their their their, their jobs which led to um, financial insecurity uh, housing insecurity food insecurity um, which then contributes to all sorts of other issues for our students you know are they you know more more concerned and more focused on their basic needs which is you know obviously rightly so Thus, they're, they're, it's going to impact their, their education. And so we see, we've seen a lot of that. And I know schools have you know, risen to the challenge to address a lot of those needs. Um, but we are also seeing you know, students who, and families who um, were, were very concerned about getting sick. You know, I remember my wife's school was one of the, the first schools in my district to start showing staff who were getting sick. And I remember my wife getting the call you may have been exposed. And so we were quarantined for a couple of weeks and just remembering, you know, what that was like. And, you know, we look back and kind of chuckle now because that was during allergy season. And so every time someone sneezed in our house or someone coughed in our house, we're like, is that COVID or is that an allergy? But, but those fears were very real. And I remember, and I'm sure we all remember as time went on uh, over the last uh, year or so, we were just very concerned about, you know, whether we're going to get sick or not. 
On the other hand, there are people that did get sick and some recovered, some it, it took a while and some it was very, very se severe and significant. And unfortunately there were others that, that had family members that, that died from COVID. And so, you know, those were very real um, concerns and impacts to our families. And because of those, the, these things, you know, with, with folks that potentially have died or died from COVID, there, there is this issue with grief that, that we're, we're, we're seeing with some of our families. And, you know, I, one of my concerns is it may not necessarily be the typical grief. Because of some of the, the unique circumstances around COVID, we might be dealing with more complicated grief or complex grief. Uh, I have a, a, a friend of mine who, who lost um, a parent during, during COVID and was not able to be there with his parent, be, be there with his mom during that time. And that was a very significant impact on him. Um, so kind of thinking about these things um, moving forward, um, as well as you know, the, the concern now of the mental health impacts of, of the pandemic for our students coming back, as well as some of the trauma that some of our students may have experienced um, during the, the pandemic and their return to school. So these are these are some of the things um, that, you know, were caused by the pandemic that are certainly impacting our families. And so, you know, when the pandemic occurred, schools heroically rose to the challenge of transition. You know, pre COVID, we were in that brick and mortar. We were in school, students were in class, engaging in, in all sorts of activities, whether it's learning, sports, arts. Um, then, the, then the closures started happening and things changed dramatically. We rose to the challenge to make that transition from in-person to virtual uh, or, or, or distance learning. And, and that, was, that was one transition that was that was pretty difficult, but we, like I said, we rose to that challenge and, and we addressed it, and we 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 addressed all these changes and trans transitions over the last year or so, as they as they as we were confronted by them. Um, and again, I, I I believe all educators did an amazing job rising to that challenge. But now we're on the the doorstep of another transition, transitioning back to, you know, full five day a week students in school. And, and part of that transition is, you know, we went from brick and mortar to, to, to virtual. Now we're coming back to the brick and mortar, but it's not going to be the same as it was, you know, first day of school 2017. It's going to be the new normal, uh, as, as George mentioned, the post, you know, the after pandemic uh, opening. Um, and so on the screen here, you see a graphic from um, that, that talks about you know, the, the four areas that we want to focus on in recovery and, and continuity, you know, academics, physical and structural elements, the business and financial, as well as the social emotional. My, my focus is mainly going to be on the social emotional, but these are the four areas we really want to think about when we, we start to transition back to uh, in person and, and recovery. This is this helps with um, just the overall resiliency and, and strength and, and recovery of our, of our schools. Um, but, you know, some of the challenges that we're going to be facing uh, with this, with the recovery from the pandemic are going to include that, that mental health and trauma um, that's been talked about often. We're also going to have to focus on how, how are we going to address that, the, those academic uh, uh, challenges that, that occurred over the past year and a half, that, that lost instructional time how exhausted our staff is. I mean, the, the heroic efforts of, of teachers, you know, transitioning to from brick and mortar to virtual and back again, um, we're gonna have to figure that out and what are some ways to help support students. And because of the pandemic, projects have been delayed. You know, some mental health staff couldn't be hired or, or we, we couldn't move forward with certain projects to help um, with the overall recovery. And then there's the financial strain on, on our schools as, as we move forward. These are some things that in terms of recovery that we're gonna be faced, uh, faced with. Okay, so um, the other thing is, you know, what uh, that I think about, what, what can we anticipate? And, and lately I've been hearing some very interesting um, statements and uh, interesting statistics, which I, I'm not really sure what I think about. Um, but I think what is fair to say is that we're, we're in it for kind of a long haul. 
you know, um, and, and this long haul is going to have ups and downs. It, it's not necessarily going to be a smooth road. Um, I've heard some statistics saying, oh, in three years, we're going to bounce back or in six months, this is going to be back in place. Maybe, maybe not. I, I, I really think there's a lot of variables and risk factors that that contribute to the trajectory of, of recovery. Um, and so I, I think, you know, getting in the mindset of, you know, we are going to um, be in this for the long haul and how are we going to address this over the long haul is going to be very important. So kind of keep that in mind. So what I want to start talking about now is how are we going to develop these initial strategies? And, and there are a number of different elements that I, I think are going to be very important when we think of these strategies for um, the return uh, to, to the brick and mortar. And, and first is taking a look at what happened and, and assessing the unique impact to your district, to your school, to, 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 to families, to groups of students within your school, and maybe even a student. What, what are those unique impacts? Because if we look at different, different schools within um, a, a school district, there may be similar uh, things that have happened, but there might be very unique impacts. And so we need to really take a hard look and, and uh, at those things. Uh, I think it's also important to really take a look at our existing resources um, and programs. What, what, what do we already have that we can utilize or have been utilizing through the, the pandemic that have been successful that we can continue to use? Then it also it's looking at what are the exact needs of our, of our, our district, our school, families, and students. And then how are we going to implement all this, this plan? Also, how are we going to examine our effectiveness? Because it's going to be very important that we measure, we identify our goals and measure what we're doing. Um, and then finally, we all have to report to somebody. How are we going to report the, our efforts? How are we going to uh, demonstrate that we're moving towards our goals? And those are some things that I think is going to be very important for us as we uh, move forward in, you know, back to the brick and mortar um, building for their students. So some basic steps I want to start uh, illustrating is really we're going to start with convening a core team. We're then going to map our, our, our resources and, and, and also identify some needs. Um, and then we're, this is where we're, the, we're really, the, the work's really going to begin is we're going to sit down with our team and identify those crisis facts. We're going to look at the big picture. You know, what are those unique crisis facts related to your school? And then we're going to drill it down. What are those unique impacts on a student or groups of students or families? Um, we're going to um, measure our uh, outcomes and then we're going to establish, come up with methods to measure outcomes. And then we're going to establish our initial strategies um, to address the needs based on our assessment of the, the facts, uh, the crisis facts. So starting with a team, you know, what does that team look like? Obviously, we want a, a nice, diverse group uh, of staff, you know, having having a teacher, having a special ed representative, having maybe a parent liaison who, who is the bridge between the school and the community, who, who also may be able to reach some of our, our um, EL families. <clears throat> we want school mental health professionals that can include school psychologists, school counselors, school social workers. Um, we might want to include front office staff, bus drivers, kitchen staff. So we have a different perspective, different perspectives on many different things that are going to be impacting our, our, our students and impacting our schools, because that's what we had to do also during the, during the closures. So kind of taking a look at the, the makeup of your team and seeing who, who these people are and what kind of, what can they bring to the table in terms of perspectives and, and ideas. Um, other, other elements we want with our team is that is to have them being connected, connected with the rest of the school and at the same time being leaders in the school and, and not necessarily a leader by title. I mean, that, that's fine. Um, you know, obviously we want an administrator on this team, so they, they, they will be a, a leader. But when I say leader, I'm, I'm talking about influence. You know, we, you know, I'm sure we all can look at our school and identify those staff members that have great influence and, you know, can, can help push the message of 
how are we going to, you know, uh, promote these strategies and these interventions to students. So you want to have that characteristic of um, your team and, and you also want them to be able to think critically, you know, how is this going to work, how can we be creative to establish these, these um, uh, <clears throat> this, this plan to support our students when they return, but also have them take a look at it another angle, you know, where, where will this go wrong, where will this break down and how can we avoid that. And then lastly, as a school system, we can't do this by ourselves, who are our community partners that we can bring in to partner with and team with. Um, other things we want to consider is establishing a, a, a schedule uh, for the entire year. Um, you know, if we don't do that, meetings are going to be missed and things like that. We want to also, this team wants to identify those goals and identify uh, data sources and then establish a picture of what progress will look like once we have a plan on how we're going to support our students. So the first step after um, identifying your team or assembling your team is identifying your data sources. And it really starts with what, is, what are you collecting already? And then taking a look at what was your pre-COVID landscape and to help establish that, that baseline. What did it look like, um, you know, the fall of 2019 before everything kind of closed? That could be your baseline, whatever you want, just looking at the data and what sources you're bringing into it could establish your, your, your baseline. Other things you want to consider, particularly as I'm thinking more about the mental health uh, recovery is, you know, during the, you know, baseline, how many suicide screenings, threat assessments and mental health contacts did you have? And then during the closures, same thing, what, what did that look like? Um, other things you want to might want to consider are um, student engagement and attendance, um, as well as identifying gaps in your data. What what else do you think would be helpful to to collect to help you um, you know understand the bigger picture of what's going on in your school, uh, as well as attainment of your goals and effectiveness. So really starting with that kind of data and understanding how you can use that to make decisions and um, demonstrate effectiveness. Next, you want to establish your goals. And it's these SMART goals that we want to uh, put into place. Um, because if we don't have goals, it's going to kind of be freewheeling. You, it's, you're going to be meandering all over the place. You really want a goal to, to aim for. Um, and, and also have the mindset of that you're going to have to refine your, your approaches to those goals. So, you know, definitely be thinking about how these goals will uh, be be established and, and again as we talk through we're going to talk about um, how we're going to measure effectiveness with for these goals and and for me as we move back to the brick and mortar we really want to be taking a look at the academic uh, academic goals behavioral goals and and mental health needs uh, goals so we want to establish that and we also want to um, align uh, everything with our tiers of support and make sure we have a, a method of uh, measuring effectiveness and tracking that progress. Those are gonna be some very important things that um, we do moving forward. Um, next, we really want to um, start mapping our resources and identifying our needs. So, you know, with your team, there, there's, this is the team that's gonna help do that. Um, and, and when I say identifying these resources, it's not just the programs you have in place. It's looking at the people. It's looking at the staff that you have. It's looking at the, the, the skills and, and um, experiences that your, your staff have that can be brought to bear on certain situations within the school. It's also what kind of services are available, as well as your community partners and other resources. Because again, schools, we, we, we can't always do things by ourselves. We have to collaborate with others to help support our student needs, particularly during times of crisis um, and, and recovery. And again, using the data that we, we've identified, um, we wanna look for patterns uh, of benefits, patterns in, in needs, um, and particularly as to what's already in place and then figure out, okay, how do we, how do we fill some of those gaps? Um, and then the next thing we wanna do is make sure that we identify some core people to maintain um, the, the, the resource map you know, not only for the next few years as we're working through this new normal, but it's gonna be beneficial once we move beyond because then we can, you know, as the needs and the challenges are gonna evolve and change. And so 
also will our, our resources. So making sure we have um, uh, that mapped out and, and updated consistently is going to be uh, helpful. And the next uh, is, is our tiers. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I think most people should be pretty familiar with this, but I'll just touch on that. Um, we want to map um, our, our mental health uh, needs and interventions, academic needs and interventions, behavioral needs and interventions, and social needs and interventions on the, on the tiers. And, and, and this is what you know, our, we're, we're going to work from to provide supports to, to all our students. Um, so definitely keeping that in mind um, moving forward. Um, starting at the um, tier one, you know, again, the, the focus here is on all students. Uh, for, for the return, we want to be considering, based on our data, what kind of prevention efforts do we want to focus on uh, for our students? And again, thinking from the, the academic, behavioral, and mental health uh, um, standpoints. Uh, and again, using your data to, to inform those decisions uh, because we want our students here. We want as many, the majority of the students will be here anyway, but we want to bring as many students to the universal levels of support as we can. Um, and on, on the screen here are some examples of, of some things you know, uh, that you can include at, at the universal level. So anything we, we can do to provide support for all students to, to help, help them manage, cope, and, and um, be successful and thrive uh, on their own. So the next area we're going to focus on is that more targeted area. And this is a smaller group of students um, on the screen. You see roughly about 10 to 25% of those students. Um, and they have some needs that aren't necessarily being addressed through the universal. Um, and so it's going to require, you know, different interventions and, and more staff to provide uh, the supports here. <clears throat> so um, again, the goal here is to move these students down to the more universal and, and, and obviously we don't want them moving up the, the, the tier. We want to make sure that they're, they're being well supported and they can thrive uh, as well. <clears throat> again, focusing on all the different areas, mental health, academic, behavioral. Um, and again, there's some sample um, examples you can do at, at tier two. But tier three is, is for students that are the most um, impactive and, and it's the most intensive kind of supports that our, our students may need. And this is at you know, roughly three, three to five percent of those students. Um, and it, it's, it, it's definitely going to require a, a, you know, more um, restrictive interventions and, and a lot more staff to, to provide those supports. Um, and you know, we're looking at significant mental health needs, behavioral needs, and academic needs as well. This is what we're seeing here. Um, you know, at this point, you know, we're, we're providing some of these services, but for the mental health services, you know, we, we're, we're limited in what we can provide. So we may be considering um, some outside referrals for, for that. So those are, in a quick overview, those are the basic things you can do with the tiers. Uh, there, but we definitely want to make sure you're mapping out your tiers uh, of supports, all, all your resources across those tiers, so we know what we can provide students at each uh, each level. Um, the next thing we want to do is once we've you know identified our goals, we've mapped out our resources, we've come up with a plan based on uh, on the tiers. We want to you know make sure that. We're, we're measuring uh, our effectiveness. We want to make sure that we're we're tracking towards our goals. So um, a very simple way to do this is through goal attainment scaling, and, and this is a criterion reference tool um, that is, is very simple to a simple method to uh, measure outcomes for all sorts of uh, of. of um, things. It's used in the, in the medical field, it's used in the educational field, um, and you can track uh, effectiveness for, for individuals, for groups, organizations, programs, and systems. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very effective uh, tool. And one of the things I think that I really uh, appreciate about it is that it, it, it provides a common language um, that we all can speak from in terms of measuring our outcomes uh, for the, the school-based uh, interventions that we're doing. Um, so whether you're at the elementary school, the middle school, or the high school, or even at the admin level, if you have the you know, goal attainment scaling in that same language to communicate your effectiveness of, of, of whatever you're measuring, everyone will have an understanding of that. 
Um, and the, the other thing that's beneficial with it is there's a variety of methods to, to assess um, your goals and your intervention programs. So it, it's very flexible in, in, uh, in its use. So how you use goal attainment scaling, you know, first you identify the focus of your intervention um, and you create your, your SMART goal. Uh, next, you want to figure out, you know, how is the best way to measure um, our, our progress to that goal? And then you want to kind of flesh out what that progress will look like, your, your outcomes will look like. You want to start with, with baseline and, um, you know, ideally you want to show, you know, slightly more than expected. You know, you want to show growth, basically. Um, and, you know, you also want to be able to identify when, when things aren't working well, because once things aren't working well, you can... You, you, ha you have to go back to the drawing board and course correct. So, um, you know, you want to identify these things and, and, and make sure you have ways to, to measure that. And it can be very simple. I remember um, probably about seven or eight years ago, I was working with a, a student who, who would complete his homework, but just wouldn't turn it in. I, I don't know why. We never really got down to that. I think part of it was his organization. Um, but we set up the goal of you know, by the every week he would turn in about 90% of his homework. And so we set up the different levels of, of, um, uh, of attainment. Uh, and the, the simplest way we decided to, to measure this was looking at his, um, what they called student view. And each, every time he would turn in something, his teachers knew to identify that it was turned in. And at the end of every week, we would look and we would kind of do a quick tally and is that 90% of the work or is that 85% of the work? And we, we had it mapped out. So it was a very simple way for, for us to track that. He understood it, I understood it. it. It was very effective in helping him understand what he needed to be do and to show success to himself as well as his parents. So um, the thing you wanna do is identify the, the baseline, identify uh, data collection points and, and be able to communicate and report uh, the outcomes out from that. So the next thing I really I want to talk about is the 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 assessing of impact uh, of this crisis, the, this pandemic crisis. And this is where um, we're going to take a look at the the crisis event, uh, and we're going to look at four four variables. We're going to look at the the predictability. And when I talk about predictability, the, did we see it coming or did we not see it coming? So the less predictable, the more impactful it is on, on, uh, on someone. Um, the duration, how long did this crisis event take place? You know, for our pandemic, it took place for o over a year. So the longer the duration, the more impactful it is. The consequences, the greater the, the consequence, the more impactful it is as well. Um, you know, you know, looking at the pandemic, you know, with job loss, you know, people getting sick, those were the, the kind of the, in terms of consequences. And then the intensity, you know, how consuming was it? How, how uh, intense was the, the emotional stressors? Or, you know, were there, were there other things that were just so consuming and intense in, in the event that uh, that contributes to the, the overall devastation of a, of a crisis. And we want to look uh, through three different lenses. We want to look broadly at our school. We want to look at the impact to students or groups of students. But we also, remember, want to take a look at the impact to our staff as well. Another lens we want to use is um, the, the, the COVID-19 school adjustment um, risk matrix. And this is also helping us take a look at um, for example, we're talking about a student, their, their pre-COVID school experiences, and then the next slide, we're going to talk about their, their, their closure or their shutdown experiences. So it's important for us to understand, you know, what some of these, these uh, risk, uh, risk factors are. Um, and so let's take a student who, you know, we, we're going to look at it three different ways. One, um, was it a positive experience pre-COVID? Was it variable? Or was it negative? And then we're going to take a look at that and then match it up with what was their their closure or, or their shelter in place experiences. So if a student had, and again, we're looking at the positive variable and the negative. So let's say we had a student whose their, their pre-COVID experience was positive. It was a good thing. They liked school, they were connected, good grades and all that. 
but then in the closure or in, in the shutdown, they, they had some, you know, their parents lost their job or, you know, the, the, you know, someone was sick in their family. So that could knock them into a moderate risk and, or excuse me, low to moderate risk, depending on um, those variables. But that's all this kind of using this framework can help us identify some students that we may need to have special care for in addition to the, the other variables that we're talking about. And so let me go through uh, just a really quick example on the school level uh, of what this might look like. So we're going to start with the crisis facts and what were some of the things that happened. And this is going to be unique to everybody. Um, and so, you know, here are some of the, the, the event crisis event facts for this school. They, they close on March 12th. They transitions to distant, transition to distance learning and then hybrid. They started realizing that families did not had, have access to, to Wi-Fi or technology or healthcare. Um, they watched student uh, engagement decline and some even stopped coming to school. Um, and, and so, you know, those are some of the other crisis effect, uh, uh, event facts that impacted their school. And then we're gonna look at the duration. How long did this occur at this school? You know, continued for most of the year. Uh, for the rest of 2020, uh, the first month, access issues to technology and Wi-Fi continued, but by the end, it was just only a handful. Um, but then they started seeing mental health increases uh, starting in October and then spikes in, in around the holidays. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is, is have a conversation about are the predictability. You know, for this school, the, I, I think for many schools, the closure was a big surprise. Um, you know, there were ongoing, there was ongoing uncertainty uh, given uh, local and state metrics and things like that. So the predictability was, was uh, unsure. And the intensity, you know, there were significant changes in instruction uh, and in, in school. Uh, there was high pressure and stress for, for students, families, and staff, community tension, staff tension. And then we go to consequences, you know, looking at um, you know, the, the impact of the closure, um, people were getting sick, loss of jobs, financial stressors, fears of returning to work, high disengagement, looking at all these things, helping us to understand all the facts, all the variables that are coming together to influence the impact of a crisis. So that's on the, on the school level. Um, we're going to go into the student level in a little bit, um, but we can also establish our goals, you know, we're going to identify for, for the return, you know, in this example, we would like to have students identify a, a trusted adult they can go to. Our goal is to have 90 to 100%. Ideally, we want 100%, but recognizing that might be uh, a challenge. We want 90 to 100%, thinking in the long term, long haul kind of approach. You know, we want to identify, develop and design ways to, to teach the importance of who a trusted adult is, where they can find a trusted adult and how we're gonna push that out and measure that. We're gonna identify our attainment levels and they're gonna assess and reassess and track our progress to that. that would, that's something that you, would be very helpful um, to track and then report to your stakeholders. So now I just wanna look at the impact of a crisis, the, the, the pandemic crisis for, with the context of a student and this could be done with a staff member as well. You know, we're going to look at the, there we go, sorry about that, a little bit of a delay, um, the crisis facts. For, for this one student, you know, they, he experienced the same closure, transitioned to distance learning and hybrid, but for, for this student, um, his mother had to return to the home country due to a death in the family, but then gets stuck in, there, in her country due to the travel restrictions then his father gets sick. And then, then the student is left to try to manage the family. His attendance is sporadic, then stops. And then he finally notifies this, the school of the situation. Um, looking at the duration for, for this student, the, the closure was ongoing. Um, the father's illness has been going on for at least a month and looks like it's gonna continue. The mother is stuck in, in, in their home country and has been for about six weeks. So this, this student has been trying to manage everything uh, for his family by himself, stopped engaging in, in academics three weeks ago, 
Um, and then, you know, the fi financial stressors are beginning to mount as time goes on because his father's not able to work. And in terms of the predictability, there we go. Um, you know, it was not predictable that the father would get sick, you know, it, uh, and then the school didn't know because no one notified the school and um, until he uh, finally notified the school. The intensity um, for the student, um, the father becomes sick uh, and, and declines very quickly. It was in intensive care, uh, has been in there for about a month. Uh, the stressors are, are uh, financial stressors are incre increasing and he's, the student has to, is starting to have to make choices about caring and supporting his family or going to school. You know, he's a, he, as, a, as, a, as a young man having to make those choices. Um, and then finally, the consequences, looking at that, you know, the student is now responsible for caring for his sibling, um, making sure that they get to school, the finances, bringing income to the family, making decisions and, and, and caring for his father. Um, the significant pressure and stress are mounting on the student, um, you know, having to make that choice between school and family and making the choice of taking care of the family. Um, and, and so these are the things that are clearly impacting the student. And oh, there we go, sorry about that. Another little delay there. Some other things we wanna be considering when particularly when we're looking at an individual student are just more unique risk factors for the student, meaning physical proximity um, and emotional proximity. And when, when we talk about um, you know, physical proximity or the exposure, we're talking about physical proximity, meaning, you know, where are they actually physically in relation to the, the crisis event? And, and the example of our last student, you know, he's in the hospital at times, you know, he may not be in the same room with his father given the COVID restrictions, but he's, he's witnessing what's happening to his father. He is witnessing the, you know, the, 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 the challenges of, of maintaining his family. And then the emotional proximity, the relationship, the closer the relationship one has to um, someone who's going through a significant crisis like the son to the father, the more impactful it is. And then we're going to talk about uh, internal vulnerabilities, what baggage we each bring to the table, and then external vulnerabilities, what are these variables that are coming from the outside that are influencing things. And that could be within the family and that could be without, you know, outside of the family that, that are impacting things. And so in this case, you know, in terms of the emotional proximity, there, he's always had a strong relationship for the father. So it's gonna be very impactful to him to watch the, him, his father be very, very sick and watch that decline um, and seeing all that, you know, he's there watching all that medical intervention and that can be very traumatic uh, to, to a young man. And then the, his own personal vulnerabilities, you know, he has some coping skills, um, but, he, his trusted adult was his father. Um, and then another uh, risk is, you know, the family does not have much social connection to aid with support. So they're, they're a pretty isolated family. So those are all things to consider within um, a, a crisis event and how we're gonna support the, the needs of the student. So now, for example, you know, goal attainment and how we're gonna support this student is, let's say it's the back, we're back at school. And he's struggling to come to class and uh, come to school at all. Um, so if he can get the first class, he usually makes it first block. He usually gets it gets through the whole day. So the goal is to get him to to class consistently. And we you know we want to set that goal, develop a plan for him. You know maybe establishing a trusted adult. Um, you know works on coping strategies with that adult. Have has a, an emotional thermometer to track where he is stress wise and then help him get to class. We're gonna map out those, um, you know, the, the attainment levels, and we're gonna measure over time to look at success. And if we have to change course or a course correct or refine our, our approaches, we, we can, and we have that data to support that. So we wanna make sure that we are um, uh, making sure we take care of that. So that's just a really quick overview of those initial strategies, that, that, that primary level of triage that establishes our initial strategies and interventions to support students returning from um, a crisis, but or returning to, to the schools. Um, but what happens next? You know, we still, once these interventions and once 
um, students come back to school, um, we move into another level of triage. You know, we're still collecting data, we're still collecting information. And once we start delivering these interventions, we're gonna be able to refine our, our, our approaches to, to further our um, effectiveness towards our outcomes. Um, and so it, it's, it's a constant data collection process. So we, we're gonna deliver more interventions, collect data, refine, um, course correct if we need to, and, and keep moving forward to uh, make sure we're reaching our, our goals. Uh, next, you know, we're, we're getting to the referral level. So we've, we've done our, our initial strategies, we refined our strategies, and now we're at the level where, you know, things seem to be stabilizing, leveling off, the dust seems to be settling a little bit, we're transitioning into a, a better flow into the school year. We're now looking at um, those students that are, are, are very significantly impacted that may not necessarily be responding to the interventions that we have in place. And particularly when it comes to mental health, um, we may be needing to refer out to, you know, more long-term therapeutic um, supports and things like that. So still we are collecting that information and making decisions and, and refining our approaches um, uh, for our students. So this is, it's an ongoing process. Some other things to think about with, with regard to the, the return to school. And, you know, this, this is just kind of big picture um, kind of things. I, I think whether it's returning to school or just in general, I think it's very, very important that we have a suicide prevention program in place. And we have fo folks who are trained to, to deal with that. And, and when I talk about suicide prevention, I mean the prevention education piece. I mean the intervention piece when we actually have a suicidal student. And then unfortunately, if we do have a, someone who dies by suicide, how do we respond to that to make sure we're, we're supporting the needs of students? So making sure that's in place, making sure your threat assessment programming is, is uh, on par, making sure your, your teams are trained and know what to look for and how to provide best support. And the other thing I think is, is really important is making sure we know how to support our teachers. Um, you know, looking this past year, uh, you know, the last day of school was, you know, we had some teachers who were absolutely exhausted with all the things that they had to address and making sure that we, we have ways that the, we can, the, that they have self-care opportunities, um, because if they're not able to take care of themselves, it's going to potentially impact the students. And then um, I think another important thing is to reestablish connection within our school. Everyone's been isolated. Everyone's been apart, um, whether it's students, teachers, and families. And it's, this is a, a prime opportunity to just reconnect, reestablish, and, 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 and bring people together to, to hopefully you know, become the school community that they once were. Um, and so, um, I know we have a lot of work ahead of us. This is definitely something that I think about often and I'm actually working on for, for my district a, as well. Um, so, you know, if, if you have any questions or, or you know, after the, the webinar, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to chat with you or answer any questions that you have. Um, and so I think we're moving on to the, the Q&A part here. Yeah, we'd like to remind everyone if you've got a question, um, for Ben, please drop it in the chat. We'll ask it, but we do have a few questions in queue already. Um, the first one is from Orfelina Cisneros. The question is, how can we start the process of making an assessment when the schools are closed? <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, I have the benefit of being a 12-month employee, so I'm, I'm zipping through the school. Um, one of the things, and, and but in my district, there's not there's only, I think, about a handful aside from administrators that are 12 months. So one of the first things that I think would be very important is the moment you guys come back to school is forming that team and starting that process. One of the conversations we've had is, you know, recognizing that majority of our staff are off for the summer, establishing a framework you know, providing that initial professional development opportunity to say, okay, this is how we want you to, um, you know, assess the needs of your school and, and, and establish your initial interventions, and, you know, have that framework ready. So when folks, you know, come back, you can hit the ground running and set a time, you know, let's say, let's say school begins mid-August, you know, August 15th, 
um, just arbitrarily say that number, and then say by September 15th, we want to have just our, our initial strategies in place. Because again, we, you're going to be constantly refining your, your approaches to, to your students and, 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 and the needs of your students in school. It's not going to be, we got our strategies, we're done. It, it's going to be a constant refining, sometimes course correcting uh, approach. So I, I would say, um, you know, establish that framework up front and, and give them the tools to, to work, uh, but also set a timeline for, for that. Okay, well, there's a follow-up question to that. Uh, would you suggest the school to send a questionnaire to families before the start of the school year? I, I would say any, any approaches to collect information that will help you would be, would be fantastic. Um, you know, and it, and it could be just a, a simple three questions. You know, what are your concerns? Uh, about the return to school. Um, oh gosh, you know, I'm trying to think of some good questions. What are your concerns, you know, behaviorally? What are your concerns academically? You, do you have mental health concerns? And, you know, if you have mental health concerns, this is who you reach out to. You know, however you want to ask the questions, I think is going to be important. So any information will be very, very helpful to help inform what you're doing. Awesome. We have another question here. Obviously, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know how this is going to unfold. But based on what you know, what makes you the most concerned? <laughs> um, hmm. What makes me the most concerned? I think for me, um, and, and again, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I would hate to have us go to close again. Um, that, that would be my biggest concern um, because, uh, you know, I, I feel like now a lot of our schools, a lot of our communities are riding this momentum of we're, we're reaching a point of normalcy again. You know, we, we can be outside, we can be connected, um, but then shutting down again, I, I worry about that. Um, I do worry a little bit, well, I, I shouldn't say a little bit, I do worry about the mental health that's coming in as well. Um, not all students are, are going to be impacted the same way. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm addressing all their needs. Um, so those are, that's the other thing I'm, I'm, that I'm concerned about. Yeah, there, there's lots of unknowns here with all of this. Yep. Um, and what was already a, 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 a heavy and persistent problem has now been compounded. We know that there's going to be a compounding effect on students already affected. It seems that a, there is also a, a, pro, a new population that would emerge that has been affected by COVID to the point where if they didn't need services before, they might need it now. Is there any data or have you seen anything to suggest you know, how large a group that population may be? I haven't seen any yet. I know that they're out there and my, my stack of professional reading, I need to really chip away at. Uh, so, so I have some uh, reports in there, but, you know, thinking for me, thinking broadly about some of the, you know, particularly um, for, for, for adolescents, you know, I work at a high school, um, the, the, the mitigation strategy of, of physical distancing, you know, that, that, we have a lot of students that have been isolated for long chunks of time. And, and what is the implication of that? Um, I, I do worry about that. Um, the other thing I do worry about um, is we have students who have been through a variety of learning environments. Some have just been right in front of a screen the whole time. Um, and, and so in, in a sense, they're out of practice of being a student in a traditional classroom. And so I, I think we're gonna have a large number of students who are gonna struggle with being back in, in, in a classroom, sitting in a desk. Uh, so we're gonna have organization issues, attention issues, um, you know, work completion issues. It's gonna be very, it, it's gonna be a very hard transition. And then we have students who, who haven't, for example, one of the things on my mind is we have a whole freshman class that may not have been in our school at all. So when they come as a sophomore, that'll be the first time they come to our school. Um, but I think um, there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see the different uh, influences uh, of COVID on students. Looks like we just had one more question come in for you from Morphalina. Um, is, there already, is there an already started tracking sheet to know, 
to, I'm not sure, to no invent the wheel to collect data, concerns, and strategies that mm. can be suitable and individualized for students when we return? Hmm, that is a good question. I, I haven't seen one, but I, I don't think, you know, I, I think it would be fairly easy to develop. You know, obviously you have the student name, grade, um, and then you could, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a spreadsheet. So, um, you know, have one column, maybe for academic concern, behavioral concern, attendance, um, you know, you can have different columns, but then have a, a, you know, with each area identify, is this a concern or not? You know, what are those concerns? And then, you know, list some kind of intervention uh, that you might be implementing. Um, you know, if you want, you can email me and we can talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of brainstorm some ideas for that if you'd like. Um, but that would be very helpful to track your, your progress of your students. I know, um, particularly when, when you're meeting as a team regularly, you know, identifying, you know, what is working, what's not, um, that will be very helpful, particularly with your goals. Yeah, and, and, and Ben was kind enough to share his, his contact and social information. We'll be redistributing this presentation, both the deck and the handout. I would encourage you to reach out. He's just a really like knowledgeable and just as important personable person. And so again, um, this has been a great opportunity for us, but it, but it sounds to me like there's an invitation to, to continue the, the dialogue. Um, so I do wanna remind you, we'll be sending out a, you know, a, a copy, a link to uh, a, a, the, the video for the webinar, plus the materials. Um, if any of you have any continuing questions, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us. But most of all, we'd like to thank Benjamin Fernandez for giving such a wonderful presentation. Um, ben, if you'll indulge me, we just have a couple of more slides and announcements to go sure. through. Um, also seeing a question for conference credit, we'll be sending out certificates of attendance there. Um, but we have a couple of slides just here at the end. Want to announce our next webinar. We have uh, the case executive director, Phyllis Wolfram is gonna be joining us. She's gonna give us a recap of the special education legislative summit, which is gonna be taking place over the next couple of weeks. If you really wanna find out what's going on on the forefront of special education, um, look no further. These are the, the, the most forward thinking progressive people that are moving the, the, the cause and the case of special education forward. They'll be specifically going in depth to things like shortage, mental health issues, incidents, um, FAPE, and a lot of these other things. So she's gonna give a recap. There's gonna be a lot of activity here in the Capitol the next month or so. And so you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. Um, this is going to be Friday, August 13th. Um, visit the Aluma Therapy website. Um, for registration and more details. Um, ben, if you could take us to the next slide as well. Um, also, we have the second annual Illumination Summit. This is a live and virtual conference. It's being held in Salt Lake, but will be online as well. For more information, um, please go to the link below. And in connection with that, we also um, chose a winner today. Um, um, amongst the people who attended. So we've chosen Diana McKay because you came to this webinar, you have been selected and we're giving you a free pass to the Illumination Summit. Um, so we'll be hitting you up and giving you more details there. Um, but again, I'd love to thank everyone for coming and most of all, Ben, that was so awesome. Thank you for joining us. And until the next webinar, we wish you all the very best Stay happy, stay cool. It's a hot summer out there um, and uh, school's just around the corner. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody.